Well, we are continuing in the Gospel of Matthew. If you uh, want to follow along, we are making our way slowly through chapter 9. And uh, if you remember, we've gone through chapter 9. Uh, several weeks ago, we went through it to get to the end because the way that Matthew is presenting uh, these stories that we're looking at are really to come to the conclusion at the end that there's a, uh, a need for the, the harvest field to be filled with workers. And so uh, we're going to continue uh, through that today. But let's uh, have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Lord God, I thank you for this time. And Father, we thank you for your word, and just ask that your spirit would be here and guide us in all that is said and done, that you would be glorified. And Father, that we would know you better. And pray that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts, and uh, just that, you, that your spirit would interpret your word for us, apply it to our lives, so that we can grow closer to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was in my last year of high school, I sat next to a girl in class who uh, we used to talk during class and after class. And uh, of course, being in high school, I was madly in love with her because I was at that age where I fell in love with any pretty girl that talked to me for more than five minutes. And uh, But one day she came to class and she, uh, she was quiet. She was unusually quiet because she was a pretty chatty person. And she didn't want to talk during class. Uh, but afterward, she uh, told me uh, that the night before, her dad had had her and her two brothers come into the living room. And he told them that he was divorcing their mother and that he was leaving. And so she, as she was telling me this, she began to cry and, and tears were coming down her face and and then she said, but then my dad said, well, don't worry, though, because our scheduled vacation to Disneyland is still on, and we're going to still go to Disneyland. And she said that her and her brothers laughed when he said this. And he got so angry that he said, if you're going to laugh about this, then we're done. We're not even going to go to Disneyland. And he stormed out of the house, and she hadn't seen him since. And unfortunately for her, she was talking to a teenager, teenage boy, that really didn't know how to handle any kind of emotions, especially uh, women's emotions and crying. And all I could say was, I just, I just kind of looked at it, I remember all that my deep insight was, wow, that sucks. And over the years, I've spoken to a lot of people in different emotional situations, and I have to say that even though I've gotten a little bit better in dealing with the heavy weight of emotion that can sometimes be brought into a conversation, that same conclusion that, ah, oh, that just sucks, is pretty much the best you can do sometimes. And in addition, I've noticed that laughter, like how she laughed when her dad said they were going to still go to Disneyland, that kind of laughter in the midst of, of hopelessness is not really all that uncommon. When, you, when you've been around people that are struggling with negative emotions, laughter is sometimes a, a, a response that you see even when people are afraid or when they're bitter about something, it's not uncommon for people to laugh at a funeral, for example. And if you've not, you know, most people don't go to that many funerals in their life. But in my profession, we go to a lot of funerals. We officiate a lot of funerals. And it's not uncommon for people to laugh during times, not when they're telling stories about the person, but even kind of in the most inappropriate areas, someone will just laugh. And oftentimes the other people will get very offended by that. And you just have to tell them that laughter in the midst of sorrow is not all that uncommon. It's just kind of a, a way people are dealing with the emotion. And I imagine many of you have kind of been into that type of situation. And so, you know, when this girl was telling me that her dad had left, was going to divorce the family, but then said, but don't worry, we'll still go to Disneyland for holiday. In that bitterness and in that anger and in that shock, they laughed. They laughed at the idea that their family is going to forever change. The security of their parents is going to be ripped away from them. But, you know, hey, say hi to Mickey. And I imagine that, that some of you have been on, you know, both sides of this conversation. You've been in situations where people might laugh at an inappropriate time. You might be in that situation where you've done it as well. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we come across a story which, like last week, is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke which are called the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
are, are kind of parallel Gospels. The Gospel of John is sort of an outlier all of its own. Uh, most people think it was written much later, and it's addressing the issue of who Jesus is. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke very much is going through what Jesus did. And in Matthew, the to- like last week, the story is told most in brief, because he's really getting to the end of the chapter where he talks about pray for the Lord of the harvest. And so in Matthew chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, it says this. This is after Jesus has been going through the crowd. He was touched by the woman last week. We talked about her. And then it says, When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd and said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. And news of this spread throughout the whole region. Now, like last week, I want to take a look at one of the the gospel stories that expands on this, and this is out of the Gospel of Mark, which tells the same story, but it's expanded on. And if you remember, the story actually begins when Jesus is in the house of Matthew, the tax collector. He's just had his conversation in the the way it's presented with John the Baptist's disciples, and then this, this person who's a synagogue ruler comes in and asks Jesus to come to his house in between Jesus leaving It's when the lady with the bleeding issue touches him, and then he gets to the house. And so this is picking up while Jesus is still speaking to the lady who's touched him. It says, while Jesus is still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. He's the one that asked Jesus to come to his house. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, do not be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he had put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand, and said, Talitha, kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. That's in Aramaic, that Talitha. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Now, if you remember from last week, I compiled the, the stories from Matthew, Mark, and Luke to give us the, the fullest account of the story. But this week, I want to do something different. This week, I want to do the opposite. I want to strip down to the details that you see in all three of the accounts and see what they have in common. And when you strip everything out, actually, some things begin to jump out, at least for me. And what you get is pretty much what Matthew's account was, but not quite. For example... Matthew talks about you know, the flute players being there. The reason why there were flute players there is you had, in, the, in even cultures today, you have groups of folks that are kind of the professional mourners when there's a time of sadness or someone dies. And these professional mourners come to kind of lead the crowd in their mourning. And so that, those were the flute players and the, and the noisy crowd, the people making commotion. But there's some other details you also don't get in Matthew's account. You don't hear about the three disciples, specifically Peter and James and John, being allowed into the room. You don't have this very preachable phrase when Jesus tells the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. And in Luke's account, he adds on, and she'll be healed. You don't find this part that Mark seems to find important, and Mark is probably actually writing from Peter's point of view. You don't really, you don't have this Aramaic phrase, the Talitha, kum, which I think is a a very intimate little detail, Jesus speaking to her in Aramaic. And the name Talitha is actually very close to this other Hebrew word for for deer, like the little deer in the woods. And so her name is kind of, uh, it could be, some people think this could be a name, actually. And you don't have the detail of Jesus telling the the parents to give her something to eat, which is kind of a funny little detail. It's almost like he's assuring her she really is alive, and you need to keep her alive. You need to feed her, you know? And so he tells them, give her something to eat. 
But the detail they all include besides the girl's not dead but asleep is this one. But they laughed at him. This, this detail is in all three accounts and is all said the same way. They laughed at him. At him. Not with him. Or not because of some clever thing that he said. But they laughed at him. And maybe they laughed because they just thought Jesus was being foolish. You know, that, that, that he was so foolish he couldn't tell the difference between dead and asleep. And so they laughed at him. Or maybe they laughed at him because it was just that little bit too late. The girl's father had come out to go get Jesus, but both Mark and Luke record that on the way back they tell the father, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? As if to say, you know, this would have been fine 10 minutes ago, but why bother him now? She's dead. And Jesus says, no, she's not. She's asleep. And they laugh at him. Maybe their laugh was meant to put Jesus in his place. Have you ever heard people argue back and forth and they're arguing to each other and someone says something and then they laugh? Like, I'm the one that does all the work around the house. And the response is, ha! You think you do all the work around the house? And maybe that was the laughter. Kind of a bitter anger kind of re response to, to Jesus. She's not asleep. She's not dead. She's just asleep. Ha! Do you think we really don't know the difference between dead and asleep? Maybe it was just bitterness. Disappointment in an unanswered prayer. The girl died. Hopelessness swept over the room. People are wailing. All the emotions of grief are pouring out. And in bitterness, they hear Jesus come up and go, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they laugh at him. Don't you, don't you think we know what we've gone through here, Jesus? Ha, huh. what an idiot. I think when this girl that I talked to in high school was telling me about laughing at this idea of going to Disneyland, it was, it was a lot of the bitterness. She had just been told her parents were getting divorced, but somehow her dad thought it was going to make it better to say, but we'll still go on holiday to Disneyland. And they laughed. She laughed, her brothers laughed, and it made him angry that they laughed at him. So much so that he left the room, stormed out. But what does Jesus do when people laughed at him? Well, he clears the room of the people who are doubting. He just says, if you're going to be laughing and doubting, get out of the room. He took the girl by the hand, and he called out her by name, Talitha Kum. And she rises to life and continues with a normal life, including eating, something as mundane as eating. And over the years, I've had lots of conversations where people laugh with joy most of the time, sometimes with sorrow, sometimes in anger. Sometimes I've heard that laughter directed toward God. You know, one of the things that is kind of a privilege but also a burden of being a pastor is a lot of times you're around people in their times of deep, deep grief. When someone dies, especially, that's close to them. But also when Life is just going off the rails for people. Their kids are, are going in a direction that's heartbreaking to the parents. Marriages are falling apart. It's heartbreaking to them. And sometimes you, you, you hear people laugh at strange times. For example, I heard a grieving mother one time laugh when she was told at her child's funeral that God just needed another angel to sing in the heavenly choir, and that's why her son died. And she laughed. I've often heard people laugh when they're told that their loved ones are in a better place, and that's a bitter laugh. It's like, huh. I officiated one time a funeral that I didn't know the person very well, and uh, I was kind of, I was an on-call kind of person for the, uh, a, uh, an older, old folks home that was across the street from our church, so I'd be called in there and then to do a funeral for people that didn't have a church, didn't have a pastor. Those are the worst, by the way. And at the funeral reception, where these people were sharing their grief over casseroles and Kentucky Fried Chicken, this one guy asked me, is their uncle in heaven? And I didn't know their uncle very well. 
But before I could say anything, one of the other people in the family piped up and said, Ha! God would never let that old so-and-so into heaven. And that little so-and-so there actually had a more colorful uh, phrase inserted there, which led to this family argument right in front of me. They just started going back and forth, and it was extremely awkward. Looking back on it, it was, it was kind of funny, but at the time, it was very awkward. I've sat with a lot of people who were in pain and dying in the hospital who would laugh when the nurse would come in and say, So how are we doing today? And they'd go, ha. One of the saddest stories that I, that I was involved in was I was speaking to a woman who was in our community. This is back in Oregon. And she went to a different church, and her, she had had a son die in, a, in an accident several years before, like three or four years before, earlier. But it was still the thing that came up whenever you, you talked with her. And, uh, and I was talking to her in, in, in the park one time. We were having like a community thing going on. And she was telling me about how someone had called her just a few days after her son's funeral and asked her if they could buy his baseball equipment. He, he liked to play baseball. He was a teenager. He had baseball glove. He was a catcher, so he had all this equipment. He had, like, the, the breastplate and the, and the ankle guards, the face mask and everything. And they asked, could they buy the, the equipment? This was only a few days after he had died. And then they offered her this price that was ridiculously low, and then their response to that was, because, you know, he's not going to be using it anyway, and he doesn't need it in heaven. And as, as she was trying to respond to all this, the person laid it on even more and said, look, I'm just trying to do you by a favor by getting rid of this old stuff that will remind you of your son. And as she was telling me the story, she began to laugh. But it was this weird kind of barking lash. She came on, ha, 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 And I, just, I was like, wow, this is getting uncomfortable. So I just kind of hugged her and said, man, I'm so sorry. And then that ah, ha, turned into sobs. And this was several years after her son had actually died. And she still, I think, had the baseball equipment. I know she kept his gloves, she said. But sometimes when things go off the rails in our life, we laugh at the notion that there's a just God, or we laugh at the idea that there's a caring God, because if we didn't laugh, we would just be so angry or so hurt that we wouldn't know what to do. So we just kind of, the emotion just comes out sometimes, and it comes out oddly as laughter. And I think it's because sometimes our world goes so off the rails, goes so sideways that it's hard for us to sync it up. It just stops making sense for a while. And especially if you've gone through a traumatic event, and some of you could give stories of traumatic events far more than I have in my own life, but those times, and you understand it, just, it just doesn't seem to sync up. This loving God, this caring God, this God that is good all the time doesn't feel all that good. And either we just shake our fists in rage or we weep, or sometimes we actually laugh. And why do we laugh? I don't know, but we do. It's just something we do as human beings. In the midst of that hopelessness, as we look into that dark black abyss in front of us, especially when it comes to like the death of a child, like Jarius, the synagogue ruler, was dealing with, and his family were dealing with, and the neighborhood was dealing with. She's not dead, she's asleep. <laughs> yeah, sure. But the hope that Jesus offers isn't something to dismiss with scorn or to just allow the pain to overcome you. And I know sometimes it seems trite when, when you're in the midst of that struggle and someone says, well, don't worry, God is in control. Or it seems just like a, a, just something that's said without a lot of thought, oh, but God is good. Because both are true. God is in control, and God is good. But from our perspective at times, even for a believer, in those dark times when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's hard to believe those things. But they are true. I find it interesting that the psalmist, when he talks about, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. 
And I've always found it strange that he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Because I don't know about you, but the idea of a, of a stick doesn't really feel that comforting, right? I would say like, you know, your arms around me is a comfort, or, you know, you clothe me in the, in the embrace of your love, or whatever. But not a rod and a staff. I've often thought, how is that comforting? But if you think about it, you know, you're a sheep, you're, you're lost in this dark valley, and it's very tempting in that darkness sometimes just to embrace the darkness and go wandering off into it and be lost forever, if not physically, emotionally, or mentally maybe. And the rod of God is, a, is, is that reminder of, wake up. There's something ahead for you. Wake up. Don't just drift off into darkness. Wake up! There's hope. And in a bizarre way, for the psalmist anyways, he found that comforting. He found the, that guiding hand of God, that guiding rod of God, kind of tapping him on the shoulder or on the head maybe. Bap! Wake up. There's more to your life than just embracing the darkness and falling into the grief to the point where you stop living. Get up. Have something to eat. You know, I hate doing funerals for people who aren't Christians. Like I told you, I was kind of an on-call pastor for this old folks' home for a while. It was really hard because, one, I didn't really know the people who had passed away. And oftentimes, after interviewing the family, it was clear that these folks, a lot of them, were not believers. There was a few that were. It was very clear. You could always tell very clearly the believers and not the believers because the believers' families knew it. They said, Mom was a believer in Christ. She trusted in him. She was actually willing to embrace moving on. She was tired of living because she knew there was something more, and there was hope. And the non-believers, you always knew it because the family didn't know they were believers or not. They'd go, well, they were a good person. I think they went to church when they were kids. Yeah, they mentioned something about Sunday school one time. As a pastor at that point, you pretty much knew. And it was very hard because for non-Christians, it's, it's hard to give them a lot of hope because I believe in Jesus. And I believe in the grace, and I believe in the hope of Jesus, but I also believe he's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. Being a good person who went to Sunday school when you were three or four years old isn't exactly being a committed believer in Christ. And I don't really know what to say to people who are without Christ when their world's coming to an end or when they're in that place of darkness. It is really hard to give hope without Christ. But for those who are believers, we can pray in that hopeful expectation that God will intervene and save a life on this earth if he desires, such as Jesus did with this little girl. I've seen enough people recover through life that I believe that prayer is something worth doing when someone is in a place of illness, and especially if there's, there's like a, a connected reason to it, like this little girl that has so much to live for. But I know sometimes the answer to prayer is no. It's not as though God doesn't answer prayer. Some people say, God never answers my, didn't answer my prayer. God answers prayer, just sometimes the answer is no. But if you're a believer or that person that, it, that it ends up going into death is a believer, we can let that idea of the soul going to heaven because we have that hope and we don't have to stay in that valley of death. So I like the response of Jesus in Mark's gospel when he tells Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And Luke adds on to it, and she'll be, she'll be healed. But that's not, the, that's not the answer that everyone's going to get in every situation. But the part, don't be afraid, just believe, that is something we can all hang on to regardless of what comes out in the situations of our life. Because we're not built, we're not made just for this time here. We're built and made for eternity. And this life is just the precursor. It's the introduction to the book which is going to be our life for eternity. But I want to encourage those of you who might be listening today who are feeling kind of bitter or ironic over the notion that God is a loving God or a just God to consider 
this response of laughter. Because what does Jesus do when people laughed at him? Did he get angry? Did he just leave the room? He did tell the people who were laughing to leave the room. He did clear the room. We know in Mark and in, and in Luke that he allowed the mother and the, and the father of the girl and Peter, James, and John to stay in the room with him. And then he simply called her back to life. Talitha, come. And then he saw to it that she was fed. Those little details of God. You know, if you're in a dark place and you find it hard to find hope right now, and you don't even want to pray because the idea is kind of the same thing that these men told Jarius, why bother the teacher anymore? Why bother him? I want you to go through this little spiritual exercise with me. If you're in a dark place, first of all, in your prayer, and if you want to do this with, just kind of close your eyes right now. And if, especially if you're in a dark place and you're hearing those little voices, the little, I call them the little monkeys that run around in your head, telling you why bother the teacher, why think that there's hope, expel those voices of bitterness. Expel those taunting laughter, the cynical laughter that may be welling up in your soul. Just expel it. And the way you do this is you just pray, Lord, get these laughing voices out of my head and out of my heart and out of my soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, silence them. And you may have to pray that more than once. You may have to pray that for 10, 15 minutes, depending on where you're at. But Lord, get this cynicism This irony, this bitterness, all which is conveyed in the laughing of my soul at you, out of my out of me. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I call upon you to get this out of me. And take as long as you need, but call on the name of Jesus because there's power in that name. It's not that the name is magic, but it's who it is. It's who it is. And then in that quiet darkness of your misery, call out to Jesus. Lay out to him your disappointment. Lay out to him your fear. Lay out to him your anger and your bitterness. And you may find that the presence of Jesus floods into your, into your life in such a way that it's hard to stop emotion Or you may feel like it's like talking to an empty room. But either way, call out. Call on him until you feel that presence of the Lord in your life. Until you can feel him begin to stabilize you emotionally and lift your head up from the darkness and start looking back at the light. Because the temptation is to just go into the darkness, just to fall into it and let it embrace you. But God has more for you. As long as you draw breath, he says, lift your head. I am with you. My rod and my staff will comfort you. And as you drift into darkness, wake up. Because I am the living God. And you are a living person. So let's live together and move into that valley where the waters run still and the table is full. And in the presence of those that would seek to harm you, you know that you are protected by me. Talitha, come. Come. Come to life. And you may have to struggle with some things. You might have to give up some, you know, the Holy Spirit might bring up things to you like you need to forgive a person, then forgive them. Holy Spirit might come up and say, you need to deal with your own sin, then confess it. Don't argue with Jesus. Just do what the Spirit leads you to do. And sometimes it may seem strange what he calls you to do, but do it. Because sometimes we hold on to our hurt. Sometimes we want to stay in the dark. Because the darkness is familiar. And then when the Holy Spirit comes to you in that presence of God, pray, pray, pray. And sometimes you don't have to say much. It could be like, Lord, I'm afraid to be a widow. Lord, bless my kids, even though right now they're off doing things that I I find heartbreaking. Lord, my marriage is a disaster. 
God, bring healing into this person's life. And let the Holy Spirit take you on that journey of pain, of self-reflection, of forgiveness, and of grace, maybe of reconciliation. Let him take you on that journey of wisdom and of hope. Let him remind you of the things that gave you hope in times of hopelessness. Let him remind you of the things that gave you joy in times of joylessness. Let him take you to those, those places where he came through for you in your life when you're in the darkness and you need to find the way through the darkness. Let his staff guide you on the path where you have those signposts that say, I was faithful then, I will be faithful now. And if there is laughter, let it be at the wonder of God as you compare it to your own smallness. That is something worth getting a chuckle about every now and then. And when you know that life has returned, then get up. Feed on his word and on his spirit. And get on with living. And you may have a long ways to go to untangle some of the things in your life. It may be a long and painful journey, and you'll have to go through a prayer like this more often. But I think sometimes as we go through the darkness, we, we ignore the shepherd. So the shepherd has to tap us in and then with his rod and staff and say, I'm here. Don't forget that I'm here. And don't let other things seduce you into its own darkness by saying, I'm going to comfort you through whatever, alcohol. I'm going to comfort you through watching, binge watching Netflix for hours or days at end. Don't let the seduction come from a friend that isn't really a friend of your soul because they don't know Christ. Let him guide you. Keep your eyes on him. We all go through stuff. Every one of us. We all go through stuff. You're not alone. Talitha, come. Wake up. Live. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and your word, as it goes deep into who we are at times. And Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would especially touch the hearts of those who are suffering either here or who are watching, who are suffering from personal loss, personal darkness. And Lord, we do pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and we call upon the name of Jesus Christ that you would be healing the hearts of our brothers and our sisters who are in dark times right now. And this coronavirus is something we're all experiencing, but Lord, we have people that are experiencing things on top of that. We have people who have children that are ill, that are, we're told they're going to die before we do, which is a very difficult thing for a parent to deal with. We have children that are in the hospital, and we're told they're going to get better, but as a parent, I've been one. It's hard to, hard to not be concerned. We have people who are struggling. It looks like relationships are over. Marriage is ending, and that's very heartbreaking. And in the midst of that, there's also other issues going on as well for some of these folks. We have people who are losing jobs, who have that fear of wondering, how are, gonna, how are we going to make this work? We have a lot of folks, Father, who are feeling in that place of that shadow of death. The death of a dream, the death of a relationship, sometimes the death of a person. Personally, I have a family member, my wife's dad, that's just kind of drifting away through dementia. And we can't go see him. And Lord, these things are painful and dark. And it's at times like these when we have prayer time and we begin by saying, God is good all the time. And some of us, myself included, Lord, in my soul at times have gone, <laughs> yeah, I believe it in my head, but man, my cynicism of my heart's not there. But it is true. You are good. 
You are the definition of good. You're the definition of love. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to get oriented back to you, that we could see you for who you are instead of seeing you within our circumstances and, and wondering, are you even there at all? And that you could maybe tap us when you have to, maybe whack us a good one if we need it from your staff and your rod to remind us to stay on the path because there is that place by the still waters where we can lie down that is coming. And maybe we'll find that in a day. Maybe we'll find it in a week or a year. Maybe we won't find it until we cross over that river and enter into eternity, but we will find it. You will guide us. And as we walk through that valley of the shadow of death, may we fear no evil. Because we are not there as victims of the enemy who wants to seek to devour us and destroy us. You can bring us through because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we rely on that and we trust in that, but sometimes we need to be reminded of it. And so may you walk with each one of us. And may we encourage one another. And when we see someone just embracing the darkness, drifting away, in that sad, lonely place of pity and heartbreak, may your staff wake them up to bring them to a place of hope. Thank you, and we praise you for the fact that we can speak of hope, that we have eternal hope found in you. We can go through, no matter, no matter what we go through, we can, at the end of the day, regardless of the situation or its outcome, say that we have eternal hope. And that is a beautiful gift. And may we live as hopeful people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.